This is Bishop John with a homily from Friar Gaw for the sixth Sunday in Ordinary Time, or what would be called the uh, sixth Sunday after Epiphany in prior times. Uh, the Old Testament reading this morning is taken from the book of Leviticus in chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, and then four, four, 44 through 46. The responsorial verses are from Psalm 32 verses 1 and 2, and then 5, and then 11. The epistle reading is from the first epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 10, verse 31, through to chapter 11, verse 1. And finally, the gospel reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1 again, uh, and the verses this time are 40 through 45. As always, I urge you to... Uh, to read through them. Uh, we take a trip in the readings today uh, from the prescribed treatment of leprosy uh, and sin, actually, in the time of Moses and Aaron to the healing given by our Lord to the sick who came to him in faith, uh, to Paul's insistence that disciples behave so that their actions drive no one away from the gospel and the kingdom of heaven. Uh, we are warned here to be careful always of our words and actions so that no soul be pushed away from the grace of God. The first reading is from chapter 13 of the book of Leviticus. It describes how the law prescribes uh, dealing with certain infectious skin disorders. Yahweh speaks to Moses and his older brother Aaron, verse 1, about the necessity of bringing to Aaron or to one of the priests among his sons, anyone who has on the skin a mark, lesion, or blotch, which appears to develop a scaly infection, verse 2. Once a priest determines a man has a scaly infection and is unclean, the priest shall declare him unclean, and that the infection is on his head, verse 44. The prescribed warning to others involves both sight and sound. The garments of one afflicted with a scaly infection shall be rent, and the hair disheveled, and the mustache covered. The individual shall cry out, Unclean, unclean, verse 45. A person remains officially unclean, meaning he shall dwell apart, taking up residence outside the camp, uh, until the priest determines the infection is no longer present, verse 46. We should note here that the skin disorders were likely not leprosy as it's translated in scripture or what we call Hansen's disease in the modern world. In verses 13 and 14, just behind the middle of the curtain, we learn about, uh, we learn most people were expected to recover from such disorders. But leprosy back then wasn't something uh, from which one recovered. Hansen's disease is curable today with six to twelve months of multi-drug treatments that kill off the uh, my what's it called my mycobacterium lepri the little beasties that cause it there is no archaeological or other evidence uh, for Hansen's disease in Palestine in ancient times so the translation of the Greek lepra uh, which was consistent with the meaning of the Hebrew Sarat into something specifying modern leprosy is problematic at best. Other debilitating and disfiguring uh, nerve and skin disorders, various kinds of rashes, psoriasis, boils, and so forth, as well as mold and mildew on clothing in rooms and on walls were serious and often contagious, but they weren't Hansen's disease. So there you go. This is maybe a, l a little more about skin diseases than you needed to hear in a homily, uh, so I'll move on. The picture we see in this case is really one of stark reality for the ancient Hebrews, 
First, there is a formal procedure for identifying one who is infected with a contagious skin disease, a frightening prospect in those days. It requires bringing one uh, who has an identified mark, lesion, or blotch, which appears to develop into a, uh, 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 into a scaly infection, uh, uh, to one of the priests for examination. That's verse 2 again. Uh, this passed for professional uh, certified examination for the time. This way, they didn't have uh, they didn't have amateurs declaring certain of their fellows unclean just to get them out of the neighborhood, or to take over their land. The priests weren't just leaders in the worship services; they were also the medical practitioners and judges in the courts. In the time in which Leviticus was composed. The priests were among the most responsible and powerful people in the community. The treatment of the victims was harsh, however, and was all about saving uh, the uninfected members of the Hebrew tribes and not about treating the patient. Once properly identified and declared infected, uh, the poor victim was required to destroy his coiffure, tear his garments, and cover up his mustache. Sometimes I expect the most redeeming feature of certain individuals. Then he had to go about yelling unclean to others uh, so that others could scatter out of his way, verse 45 again. Finally, he had to live away from everybody outside the camp, verse 46 again. Does the word pariah come to mind? There's no mercy here, merely the justice of the law. The underlying assumption at the time was that the disease was a, was a consequence of sin and so properly fell under the purview of the priests, irrespective of any medical expertise they might have had beyond diagnosing illnesses. <clears throat> it, was, it was indicative of a spiritual problem that could harm the community, no less than the spread of the physical disease. On the one hand, the physical and spiritual survival of the community was of paramount importance, so harsh measures were in order to protect it from the spread of dangerous and infectious diseases. On the other, the pitiable circumstances of the outcasts had to pull on the heartstrings of their fellow Hebrews. The priests whose duty it was to pass judgment and to protect the community <clears throat> undoubtedly appeared heartless to many. In any case, the appearance of an infectious disease condemned its victims to lives of isolation for the duration. The notion that some individuals should be sacrificed for the good of the community is in clear evidence here and will continue on in Scripture. It also appears on the lips of the high priest Caiaphas when the Sanhedrin convened to discuss the uh, the Jesus problem, as it were, John 11.50, calls for clemency and mercy when they may involve the dissolution and destruction of our civil society are usually difficult to sort out for most of us. This involves rather a delicate dance, I think, and one we should undertake with care. What makes me feel wise and righteous may in fact be foolish and sinful especially when I'm so damn sure I know the mind of God. Go figure. The verses from Psalm 32 today proclaim the greatness of the Lord. They also point out that he takes care of his people and will restore them to their, restore to them their inheritance. The Lord blesses those whose fault is taken away, whose sin is covered, verse 1 and those to whom Yahweh imputes not guilt, in whose spirit there is no guile. Verse 2. When he confessed his faults to Yahweh, the guilt of his sin was removed from his shoulders. Verse 5. He urges all those who are just and upright of heart to exult and rejoice and be glad in Yahweh. Verse 11. Yahweh is merciful, forgiving, and saving. As it says in the responsorial verse, when they turn to him in time of trouble, they are filled with the joy of salvation. Verse 7. 
The usual way to be blessed by God is to follow his commandments. But here we see King David describing another way. Probably written after he committed adultery with Bathsheba and arranged the death of her husband Uriah in about 1034 BC, he has clearly sinned egregiously and therefore following God's commandments was the road not taken by him. His guilt has weighed heavily on his spirit, but his sincere confession has lifted it. It was replaced with an almost giddy joy as he experienced the mercy of God meted out to him in its fullness. Yahweh's bright and forgiving light shone through the darkness of his sins, and it saved him. Even though we tend not to tie calamities that may impact us to our sins the way the ancient Hebrews did, the verses reflect how blessed we are to have not only the justice of God with us, the justice of God, but also his mercy, forgiveness, and healing. And all this is available to those who stand before the Lord naked, in effect. No arrogance, no lying, no rationalizing, just confessing our sins in all humility before our Abba and our Messiah. As the suspicion dawns on us, it's the only way out of our despair. <laughs> this sincere and contrite submission to the justice and mercy of God sounds like it should be simple for us. It isn't. An honest, thorough, and deep confession is no easy mountain to climb, but that's what's required for the joy of salvation King David has experienced and talks about here in these four verses of the psalm. This kind of confession is rare. We usually beat around the bush or make excuses for why we didn't actually sin. Another tack is to whittle the sin down in our minds until it's a tiny little thing that's easily forgiven. Often we admit we have sinned, but only because of someone else's heinous treatment of us. That is, they were so bad to us that we couldn't really do anything but what we did. Because of the way we're built, at least those of us who are psychotic, these alternatives don't ultimately get rid of the burden of our guilt. Our shoulders remain bowed and our spirit bent until we finally take the journey David has shown us here. The confession is as difficult as the forgiveness of our Lord is exhilarating. At the end of chapter 10 of his first epistle to the Corinthians, Paul recommends dedicating everything we do to the glory of God. He urges the Corinthians to do everything for the glory of God, including eating, drinking, and whatever else they do, verse 1031. They should avoid giving offense, whether to Jews or Greeks or the Church of God, verse 1032, just as he tries to please everyone in every way, not for his own benefit, but for that of the many that they may be saved, verse 1033. Just as Paul imitates Christ in this regard, he tells them in the opening verse of the next chapter, they should imitate him. Verse 11, 1. Paul is asking for a different kind of behavior from us than what we normally would expect. That's pretty much the case, I think. For many of us, sacrificing our own best interests for those of our community is held up as the ideal. <clears throat> for others, especially those raised in a society that celebrates the endeavors of rugged individualists, we expect our own best interests will eventually benefit those of our community, and so they are paramount. Paul doesn't pick one way or the other for us, but instead tells us to do everything for the glory of God verse 31 uh, of chapter 10 again. When he tells the Corinthians to imitate him as he imitates Christ, verse 11, uh, 1 again, he isn't telling them what to do. He's telling them 
to focus on what they can do for the glory of God, not as Jesus did, uh, just as Jesus did, and not waste their time uh, squabbling over other issues or aggrandizing their issue, their egos in one way or another. It wasn't easy in the corns of the time, and it isn't easy for us now, but there you go. There aren't any rose gardens here, just gardens and fields for us to tend for the glory of God. To do as Paul suggests requires a certainty, a, a kind of abiding peace as we stroll the highways and byways interacting with our brothers and sisters. I don't mean by this that we stay inside the cocoons of our comfortable and well-known communities, whether family or friends, church or secular. I mean mixing it up with the general population around us, all the unknown folks, certainly uncivilized and impolite, who might just provide more than a little aggravation for us. Who knows? They, and our reactions to them, might just provide a little unexpected edification for us, a little peek here or there at the mind of God. Well, our Lord may or may not be in the little boxes we prepared for him. He, in any case, is not only in them. The reading from chapter 1 of the Gospel of Mark stands in contrast to the prescribed treatment of those with leprosy. See how our Messiah, a walking, talking, living expression of our Abba and his love for us, deals with the horrible disease. When a leper came to Jesus and begged him, saying, If you wish, you can make me clean, verse 40. He took pity on the fellow, stretched out his hand, touched him, and said to him, I, I, I will do it. Be made clean. Verse, verse 41. Uh, the leprosy disappeared instantly, and the leper was made clean. Verse 42. Before dismissing him, Jesus warned him, verse 43, to tell no one and simply show himself to the priest, offering for the cleansing what Moses prescribed, so, so they'd have proper proof of the healing, verse 44. <clears throat> Elated at being healed and not good about following orders, the fellow began to publicize the whole matter and spread the report abroad so that it was impossible for Jesus to enter a town openly, verse 45. Our Lord remained outside in deserted places, but even so, the people kept coming to him from everywhere, verse 45 again. Uh, Jesus had been outed, as it were, and had to stay outside the towns, just like the lepers in Leviticus. Irony, anyone? Anyone? Our Lord's diverse authority and his desire to heal the leper brought about the healing. The priests couldn't do this, but they could witness the healing as they had been required to do from the days of Moses. The seal of their witness, as it were, was the official sign that released the leper from the shadow world of the outcast and brought him back into the Jewish community. Even today, when an ordained priest administers the sacrament of unction, the anointing of the sick. It is the grace of God and the Holy Spirit that lift and heal us in spirit, mind, and body. It is the job of the priest just to witness the healing and proclaim it as the work of God. I'm sure the Pharisees among us shudder with horror. The prescribed treatment for lepers put in place to save society from being destroyed by the disease was simply ignored by our Lord. Touching a fellow was dangerous because the disease might transfer to him, so to speak, but that's what Jesus did. The infection, in a sense, went the other way. Our Lord's touch healed the leper and did so instantly. Verse 42 again. The divine medicine was clearly and shockingly evident to the patient and he wasn't going to keep quiet about it, verse 45 again. I don't think I would either, quite frankly, would you? Like my friend Alan would remark, I'm just saying. 
the uh, the lessons today are all really about our sin and what it takes for us to be rid of it on the one hand and still function in society on the other the law in Leviticus was put in place to protect the community by isolating the sin and disease until it was cured but consigned the sick in that case uh, to conditions that, that appear to us at least to be almost subhuman. The blessings of God are given lawfully to those of us who follow his commandments, but we hear in Psalm 32 that they are available even to those of us who break his laws if we can approach God with humble and truly contrite hearts. His mercy endures forever is proclaimed in Psalms 100 verse 5, 106 verse 1, 107 verse 1, 118 verse 1, and in the second half of all 26 verses of Psalm 136, and in many other places as well. From one end to the other, the scripture is filthy with the notion, not exactly countless times, but close. In the gospel, the one with leprosy, or probably some other kind of contagious sin disease, begged Jesus for healing. Our Lord stretched out his hand and the mercy of God was made manifest. I, I would guess, frankly, that the fellow in his overwhelming and hyper-excited elation probably didn't go quietly to a priest to receive any kind of official recognition of his return to good health, despite the Master's order. Finally, Paul's suggestion to all of us when we're faced with decisions, whether difficult or otherwise, is to do whatever we do in our communities for the glory of God and not worry too much about crossing the T's and dotting the I's, or who's getting more of the limelight and the credit and who's getting less of them. The business of living in communities and keeping the glory of God uppermost in our minds is tricky. We ought to live so that the light of Christ within us shines so brightly that it is apparent not only to our family and friends, but also to those outside our inner circles. Unsolicited opinions aren't worth much. They often make things worse. But it is also true that leaving a real problem unaddressed means it'll just grow worse. When harsh words are called for, refraining from using them is akin to enabling an addict. On the other hand, injecting harsh words into a delicate situation can cause a really harmful explosion. There is a balance needed between what we do for ourselves and what we do for others and for our communities that isn't easy to define. It isn't always the same and it doesn't follow rules very well, so constraining our behavior to what serves the glory of God is the only constant we have. But it is tricky. I can only uh, know after the fact whether what I have said or done is consistent with what the Holy Spirit has whispered to me. It might instead simply be convoluted blather that was mostly patting my ego on its ugly little head. Even the bishops at Nicaea offered up the scriptures and the creed to the whole church and didn't impose it. They knew that over time its use in the congregations would confirm or debunk their own belief that they had read the mind of God. Focusing on Jesus Christ, I think, and especially on his love, his mercy, and his humor is the best shot we have at making things around us better and not worse by what we think, say, and do. God bless you and yours and keep you safe in the hollow of his hand.